This is Danny Flexen here for Seconds Out. Delighted to be joined by highly esteemed trainer Pete Taylor. Pete, how are you doing? Thanks, Tony. Thanks for having me on. Uh, anytime. It's, it's an honour. It's the first time I've had the pleasure of interviewing you and also the first time I believe you've been on the channel. So welcome. Hopefully it won't be Thank the you last. Thank and, you. Um, Thank you. Because it is the first time, I want to take you through from almost the very beginning, um, if that's OK. I believe you were born over here in England. Um, in Leeds. Yeah. How, how old were you when your family moved to Ireland? Uh, my family didn't move to Ireland. I uh, moved to Ireland myself when I was 15. And what, what was so, that? Why, why did you move? I just, um, I went over, I was, I was boxing at the time and I had a, I had a fight over in, um, in Ireland. So I, was, I went over and fought with a boxing club and I stayed there. Oh, wow. How, how did that yeah. kind of come about though? Like, how did you end up staying when everyone else went home? I just made friends over there very quickly, and uh, then I was offered a, I was offered a job. You know, times were different then. At fifteen, you could work no problem, and I was offered a job, and I just stayed there and, and, and worked. And no kind of close family ties, kind of calling you back to England. You were happy to make the move at such a young age. Seems like a big thing to do. Yeah, there was no problem. Yeah, no, there was um, probably I, probably I came from a dysfunctional family, so I was happy enough to get away from it. To tell you the truth, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Um, and you were you were a very talented boxer in your own right. Why did you never go pro? Why did you uh, only go amateur and then move into coaching ultimately? Um, at the time, there was no opportunities in Ireland. Um, plus, I had four children as well. And uh, you know yourself, the pro game, it's an eye game to make money. And especially when you're starting off, you've got to be earning a living. If you've four children as well, it's, um, it's, 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 it's difficult to do that. How old were you by the time your fourth child was born? Uh, 25. <laughs> wow, four kids at 25. I mean, I've got yeah. one at, what, 40 I am. So, yeah, I can't <laughs> even imagine how challenging yeah. that was. How did you yeah. kind of pay the bills? What, what did you do for a living alongside the boxing? Um, I was an electrician. So I had an electrical company, so I, I was working away all the time. So when I was doing uh, security, I, I was doing door jobs, and I did everything to make ends meet, as you do. Wow. And they've obviously all grown up to be to be very successful in their respective fields. So you've obviously done a, a fantastic job. Um, how did you move from active boxing into coaching? Um, I think it was just a natural progression because um, my kids were all interested in, three of my kids out of four were interested in, um, in boxing. So I was in a club there and there was no club in the town where I was from, from Brent. There was no club at the time in Bray. So I just opened a club in Bray. Then I just, when I finished, I had my last fight, I think, how much if I had 34th? I think that was the age I had to retire then. So then I went straight into coaching. And did you find it easy? Because obviously there wasn't a boxing club in that place before. Did you find it easy to attract fighters? Yeah, it was easy because there was nothing there. But, um, and then that was the 1990s. People were always looking for something to do. So um uh, and I opened up in the local community where I was from, so um, it was easy. We were we were full from the start, and like I say, my own kids were mad into it, so um, it, it was easy for me to do it. Did you ever anticipate that one of your children would go on to be as successful as Katie's been? And did you think out of the three that were into it, it would be her that would stand out? Um, oh, she was really competitive with any sport she did. Um, she was. Um, she was a great runner. She won county championships. She was playing football for Ireland. And at the time when she boxed, there was no female boxing at all, you know. Mm. So she was just getting stuck in. I, the, actually, the first time she went boxing was was my last year of boxing. And I just fetched up. I was babysitting. And um, just I just brought up to the club. And I, I was skipping away. And I turned around. She was in the ring sparring with the young lads. <laughs> so she's, 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 she's not bad already, you know. And um, she just had a natural talent for it. And... Um, I remember the other young lad said, oh. it was the first time I'd taken either of them to the boxing club. He says, I'm not getting this fine. She says, don't fancy that on. Then he saw his little sister in there sparring. And the following week, he, he, he took boxing up there and then he, he, won, he won an Irish title as well. So, um, yeah, they were, they, were good. they were good, naturally good at the, at the boxing, you know. Before she kind of came through and showed that promise, what was your perception of female boxing? What was your view on it? Uh, I had to tell you the truth, he had no view on it at all. Um, I knew De Deirdre Gogarty, 
Mm. Um, she, she boxed out the same club as I boxed out from St. Saviour's. I knew Deirdre, and I knew Deirdre was a great boxer, but I had no really, no really interest in it, to tell you the truth. I had no, no perception. I just, I just, I just never thought it was going to happen. And um, so I just let her box away. And um, she was, we were entering into club shows, we were putting into club shows and leaving the headgear off, not telling anybody she was a girl, throwing her in there. And she was baiting the boys, beating the all, beat all Ireland champions, and then the club got a few suspensions from it over it, you know, over putting her into these competitions. But we just kind of pushed away with it. And how did it kind of evolve from a coaching perspective? Obviously, you got better fighters coming into the club as you got more successful. Worked with the high performance team as well. How did that all kind? Of, how did that journey progress? Well, I think success follows success. Once you have one decent boxer in. Then, then you, you know, once you've one good boxer, everybody follows on with them. You know, they drag them along by the by the coattails. You know, um, I always find that if you have a good fifty-seven kilo boxer in your, in your in your club, you had a good sixty or a good fifty-four kilo boxer. You know, so they just fetched each other on, and you know, and then as you're growing as a coach as well, you're, you're improving as well. And especially, I had a huge interest in it, and I was going away to different seminars and going to Eastern Europe. I was fetching coaches in from from Russia for seminars and I was just mad into learning, you know, because in all fairness, I didn't think, no disrespect, to, this kind of disrespectful to the coaches, but I didn't think I got coached that well myself. Mm. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to be more technical and um, I was, ju- I was just an out and out fighter when I boxed, you know, and um, so I didn't want any of my boxers to box like me. I wanted them to be more technical. And how would you define if you could your coaching philosophy? Um, I love the technical end of it, you know. Um, I think is that the the thing of boxing is hit and don't get hit. You know, obviously now if you have a fight there, you have to still make this. You've got to have the same philosophy. He still, if he's a fight, he's still going to hit and not get hit. And, and there's different ways of doing that. But um, you know, I think I think any fool can fight, but very few can box. You know, you know, two dogs on the street fight. Um, so so teaching. Teaching how to hit, how to hit and not get hit is my philosophy. You've had a lot of success in recent times. We'll talk about that in a bit with, with pro boxers, of course. How does that compare to the feeling you got when Katie won gold in 2012? Because you that's someone you've taken from the very beginning of their career, regardless of if she's your daughter or not, to the very summit of the amateur game. Um, I suppose it's always going to be hard to compare to that because with it being my daughter as well, you know, Mm. So, um, and the, the whole country expected Katie to win the gold. So, there was so much pressure for that day. I mean, I didn't enjoy the Olympics at all, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I thought it was just pressure all the way through, you know, and I didn't enjoy it at all. And I don't think Katie enjoyed it because like, obviously there was so much pressure. But, um, you know, I'm still to, I've still to win a world title in the boxing, yeah, in the professional boxing. And we, Katie won five world titles in, in the amateurs. But, um, I'll tell you when uh, we win the first world title. How it compares? <laughs> did you ever foresee yourself moving into the pros eventually, or did you think you were just going to be an amateur coach for life? No, I actually didn't. I um, I was actually happy enough doing the amateur coaching, and the first boxer that approached me was Sean Turner, a big sexy, mm-hmm. um, and then um, then Davy Oliver Joyce. You know, I knew David from the from the amateurs as well, and I knew Sean Turner from the amateurs. Then Luke came over to me. Then Gary Cully came over to me. So it's just a kind of a pro. Just I was still running the amateur club at the time as well. Mm. So I was doing the amateurs and pros. Now I'm just I'm just solely based on the pros. But um, yeah, it was never anything I really aspired to do. Um, so then, okay, when I first when I got Sean, started training Sean, I had to look a little bit more at the way the pros train and and the the, just the physicality of the professional game. I think that's the that's the main difference uh, amateur, between amateur and boxing and professional boxing. It's just the physicality of it. I mean, it's still boxing at the end of the day, but it's like playing seven aside rugby or fifteen aside rugby, and it's just it's just so physical. Now, uh, twenty eighteen, uh, terrible tragedy, of course, occurred at your gym in Bray. Uh, you were shot twice um, in the incident. Someone else tragically lost their life um just tell us your kind of reflections on that very very sad day of course 
Yeah, I was actually, I was only shot once, thank God. Oh, I thought it was <laughs> once in the arm, yeah. once in the chest. I must have. No, it went, it went through my arm. It went through my arm into the chest. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and no, I just, uh, we were training there in the early morning and then some gunman came and started chewing around the place, shot, shot one of my friends and um, I had me back to, I had me back to all this when it was happening. I was plugging in music to start the session. I turned around seeing my lad chewing away at everyone and I just ran across the the gym floor to jump on him and I jumped, jumped on him and I'm getting shot in the, in, the, in the process, you know. So, and it was quite a bit... Sorry. Oh, sorry. I can't yeah. I can't talk too much about it because the murder trial's on in, in at the end of this month. So you can't really I don't I don't know if you can if you can really Yeah, no, no, it. I understand. I was gonna ask just a little bit about that because I know the trial yeah. was taking place, it got extended by a couple yeah. of months and then it, it collapsed unfortunately because the, the jurors, one of the jurors was seriously unwell. Um so that yeah. must be pretty frustrating from your part that the, the person, if it if they are guilty, still hasn't been brought to justice. Yeah, no, like, like I feel sorry for for the chap who's killed Bobby Messi. His family is tough. It's tough on them. I, I, you know, I've kind of a strong mindset. I've just got on with life. Um, I just carry on with it, you know. And I only think about it when when I think about it when the time comes, when the court, when the court case comes up. But in between that, that I don't even think about them. It. it doesn't actually cross my mind to tell you the truth. And there were issues afterwards in the aftermath with getting back into the gym, I believe, as well. And that ended up in court and stuff. What's the situation now? Where are you based now? And, and is that side of things all done? Oh, that's still in court as well. Oh, right. <laughs> we're, we're in Ireland over here, you know, every day, every, every, everything takes about 10 years, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, when I got shot, I was in hospital. And then the council, I, oh, I rented the premises from, changed the locks on the club. Mm. So and and all the gears still in the club, all the boxing gear, all the the ring, the gloves, the bags are still there where we left it. Um, was, was three years ago now. So now we're based in the Coliseum, gym in Ballyferma, um, great facility over there. It's just after an extension going gone on it there with recovery rooms there now, with a health food cafe, uh, altitude centre, with with a, with his own uniform boxing now. So it's um, it's a real high performance unit out there. So it's um, it's great for the lads. And do you work with like a, a nutritionist, a strength and conditioning coach, or do you do it all yourself? I do most of the strength and conditioning myself, and uh, the lads have their own nutritionists. So um, so like today we had a um, we had a spa today, and we had a running session this afternoon. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday we do a strength and conditioning. Everybody's on different phases, obviously, because different times of fights. Uh, preparation of fights but um, yeah I do most of the strength and conditioning with most of the lads and um, but they all have their own nutritionist and how many have you got in the gym in total at the moment pros 14 would you believe <laughs> yeah. yeah it's really grown then <laughs> it must be like Bray in the early days when the amateurs kind of came in and in and in now you've got the same with the pros success breeding yeah success. yeah I would tell the people away to tell you the truth down so um we we let a few go last year, you know, because they were keeping up with us with the, the standard we were expecting. So, you know, you've kind of got to be fairly ruthless as well because we don't want people holding people back. But the the great thing about having so many pros is we don't have to go looking for spars really. Now now saying that we're going to England next week for sparring, um, we we're going over to Manchester for sparring next week. Uh, we're taking five of the pros over just for the for the change of scenery as well, you know. But um, we don't really look for. We don't need to look for sparring. But the only problem with, my, with the, the pros I have out of 14, I think nine of them are southpaws. Right. Yeah, I can see why that might be a problem. So they end up southpaws and sparring the southpaws all the time, you know. So that's the only problem we have there. Now, out of the 14, can you pick out kind of two or three who are most likely to win a world title sooner rather than later? Because I'm sure they're all at different stages of their careers. Yeah. Um, I think obviously Jazza. Mm. Jazza's a gem. I think Jazza, um, Gary Cully, mm. obviously, a few fights. Like Tommy Mack was very close last year. I thought if it'd be, I think he's going to, looks like, be fighting Billum Smith again. He was very unlucky to lose that. Um, he probably could be two fights away from the world title. And then um, Sean McCombs on a great run now as well. So they're all, like I said, they're all at different stages as well. But um, them far look likely to be fighting for world titles now shortly. 
How important do you think it is for a thriving boxing gym to have people at different stages so the young prospects have got contenders to look up to, the contenders can look at the world level performers and they can all bounce off each other in that way? Oh, it's so, so important. Sorry, in, in that group I mentioned there, I should, should have mentioned Tyrone. Tyrone McCullough, he's a, he's a tough fight coming up against um, a lad from the UK there now. And um, that's, that is possibly a world title eliminate, eliminator as well, you know. I don't mind if I didn't mention him. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I've spoken to him a few times. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, um, yeah, no, it's important because that, they know that's the level they have to be at. You know, and um, for when they're, when they're sparring with these lads and these lads on the TV or, or, or they're fighting for European titles or international titles and then they're in there and they're, they're competing with them, it, it's so important for them because it, it measures where they are in, in their own career, you know. So, yeah. Um, and they know that's the, they're looking up to these lads and these lads, how hard these lads train, how, how they live outside of the camp. Um, you know, it's, it's so important for them. And you mentioned Tommy McCarthy there. I think a lot of people thought he was desperately unlucky in that fight with Chris Billum Smith. Is it looking likely that the rematch will take place next or, or this year? Yeah, it looks like it could be, it, it could be a, in the next few, hopefully, the next few months is what we're hopefully looking for because that's what he was promised. But and I, I, and I don't say, and now he was unlucky not to get the decision, but it was not a look. It was Bill Smith fought 100 percent to what he can do. Fight Tommy fought to 60 percent, so Tommy is only self to blame for that loss. And Tommy knows that. You know, I'd be fairly critical about Tommy's performance that day with Tommy as well. You know, so you know, Tommy can only blame himself for the loss, and he does that. And you know, if in all fairness. He can't, we can't blame the judges or anything for that. You know, like Tommy didn't box to his potential. Um, but hopefully, um, hopefully get the fight again and I think it'll be a completely different result. And Jazza, how did his kind of pilgrimage, if you like, from Liverpool come about? Um, he came over, like Georgie, Georgie, a legend, Georgie Vaughan retired. So he came over and he just wanted to train over there with no promises of anything. Um, he just he said he, he was trying a few different trainers out and he came he trained over here and uh, Dublin's like Liverpool as well so he felt it was it, sorry, he was welcome straight away uh, the lads in the gym are mad you know the lads that helped me out there just if they like it they like it and that's the way it is you know and, and Jazz got on well with everyone he enjoyed the training then he went around to a few other gyms and tried it out and then he rang me up and he says do you mind if I join you I says, Gee, it'd be great for you to come over here. So he's been over ever since. And uh, he's added so much to the gym as well. His work ethic's unbelievable. And it sounds like your life in the gym is pretty all-consuming. Do you get a chance for much of a, an existence outside of boxing? No, I'm pro. I am consumed with boxing. When I'm outside of the gym, I'm writing out programmes. With, with so many pros, they're all on individual programmes. So it's, it's a full-time job. So, um, yeah, look, I enjoy it as well. I like, I, I love it as well. So um, it, it's easy for me to do it. It's easy for me to get up on the morning knowing I'm going boxing, coaching boxers. And uh, and once the lads give me the same commi commitment, I'll give them a commitment as well. So uh, it's, it's enjoyable. Now, something I know people want to know, and, and you don't have to comment on it, of course, but I wanted to ask while I've got the chance. How are things now between yourself and Katie? There's been so much written about it in the last few years, straight from the horse's mouth. I thought it was always better to, to go that way. Yeah, look, it's great. Kate was on for Christmas. We were out a good, good lot of times together, went for food. Great. It's, uh, it's great, you know. The, the problem with me and Katie, me, probably do is talk about boxing as well, you know, because <laughs> she's, she's as bad as me. So um, now it's great. I mean, she's loving life over in the States. She lives in the States. It's for hard for her to live over here in Ireland because she's so small and, uh, you know, he, she couldn't even come over here and train because, she, you know, she can't walk down the road, you know, in all fairness to her, you know, um, without people stopping her. And, and, you know, Kate is so quiet and polite that she wouldn't refuse anyone. So um, I think she's better off in the States just just so she can have a life, you know. Um, like I say, there's... There's not much she can really do over here because she, she's so well-known and, and, and so well-loved by the public. And there's talk of her and Amanda Serrano's fight, which is all but confirmed now, being the biggest female fight of all time in the pros. Would you take a certain element of pride in that, in that you were at the very beginning of the journey? 
yeah, obviously, like, uh, like I hate watching Katie box. I don't watch a box now to tell you the truth because I've no control over what happens. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I only I look at the fights afterwards. Um, so then that can be, I can be critical and uh, 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 unconstructive as well. And then I give a, a, a call afterwards and, and tell her what I thought. But yeah, I'm delighted. Um, you know, at the end of the day now, you know, you know, I say so the professional boxing is business, you know, but Kay does look at his business. She just wants to win all the belts. You know? And, you know, I just wonder, like, when is she going to stop boxing? Like, you know, but then, you know, talking to her, she's so much desire still for it. And, um, you know, she's she's been lucky in the last in the last in the last year of boxing because she's nearly gone into every fight with a little injury, you know. And she she'd never speak about that to anyone. So if people think, oh, she's the performances are declining, they all she's not had camps and a proper camp yet now. So you know I mean, if she has a if she, if she has a great camp against Serrano, who was very really dangerous as well, I think you'll see um, a different Katie as well. Um, I think she, I think she she wins wins that fight fairly comfortable if she gets a good camp behind her, you know. But um, you know, when everyone is trying to predict fights, it, you know, people don't realize it all depends on what's happening in the camp, how they are. Nobody knows if anybody goes into fights injured. Like Tommy McKay went into his European defense, not against Bill and Smith, the one before that with a broken hand. Wow. You know, and uh, we fought that fight we won, but nobody knows that, you know. So. And then if somebody doesn't perform well, they say, oh, geez, they must be on the decline, must be on the decline. But they don't know what's really happening in the camp, you know. That was one of the best performances of Tommy's career. Yeah, one hand. Yeah, <laughs> says it all, doesn't it? I'm going to break his hand next for the next fight. It's interesting you say about, you know, when will Katie stop? You only stopped, arguably, because you had to, because there was a mandatory retirement age and you're still involved in the sport. So maybe that's just the thing, that you're, you're both kind of similar characters, all consumed by the sport. Yeah, like which look, I when I stopped to carry on doing, I was doing unlicensed boxing as well, so I, I didn't really stop, you know. So um, yeah, look, you know, and, and look, I think once you, like once you're enjoying it, who cares about the all oh, or this or that? Why would you stop anything if you enjoy doing it? You know, like you know, like, and I think that Kay's got that same mindset. She loves boxing. She loves training. She loves the fights. So. You know, people say, oh, you should stop now while you're, you're zero. And this. And she says, I don't care about zero. I just want, I mean, if I'm enjoying it, I'm going to box, you know. And she doesn't do it for the money in our fairness. She does it because she loves it. So you can't, you can't ask people to stop doing something they enjoy. I agree. Really, really appreciate your time. Um, we've got to do this again. Uh, it's my fault. It's been so long before we did it the first time, but we, we should definitely do it more often if that's okay with you. Ah, great stuff. Thank you. Thank you.